Welcome to Massey Dialogue. Bienvenue. My name is Nathalie Desrosiers and I'm the principal of Massey College. Today's dialogue, which is about the digital world, democracy in the digital world, human rights in the digital world, is something that we are all concerned about. We're so pleased to have this dialogue being organized by Julian Posada, former Donald Hall. I want to acknowledge that the show will be produced from Massey College, which is built on Indigenous lands, lands inhabited by Indigenous people for thousands of years, the Yorunwanda, the Seneca, the Onashawnee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. It is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship to this land and the great privilege that we have to continue to do our work here. Very fortunate today to have a dialogue with uh, the former uh, Massey lecturer, the, the Ronald Debert, who uh, I think uh, will provide us with uh, a great introduction and a great overview of the challenges that are uh, embedded in the digital world today. This is a, a topic that has been studied and has been at the core of Massey's discussions for quite a while, and we look forward to a continued discussion on that very topic. Julian. Thank you very much, Principal De Rossi, for the welcome. Welcome, everyone, to today's Massey Dialogue. Today, we're discussing the transformative role that tech companies are playing in our society. We will focus on two main areas. First, the challenges to democratic values that tech companies present, including equality, privacy, among others. And second, we will talk about the invisible workers behind the tech companies. We will take audience questions toward the end of the hour, and we will welcome you to add your questions in the chat. Massey will be live tweeting, so join the conversation there at Massey College. And please like this video and subscribe to the Massey College YouTube channel in the bottom right corner of the video screen. Now let me introduce our speakers. Professor Ron Dybert, whose Massey lecture last year, Ripwood, was on this very topic, is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Citizen Lab at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. As Director of the Citizen Lab, he has overseen and been a contributing author to more than 120 reports covering path-breaking research on cyber espionage, commercial spyware, internet censorship, and human rights. These reports include the landmark Tracking Ghostnet Report, China's Great Canon, The Kingdom Came to Canada, and the Reckless Series. He is co-editor of, of three major volumes with MIT Press and is the author of three books including Reset, Reclaiming the Internet for Civil Society which was delivered as part of the 2020 Massey Lecture Series. Next, we will also hear from Professor Julie Chen. Professor Julie Chen is Assistant Professor in the Institute of Communication, Culture, Information, and Technology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, and holds a graduate appointment at the Faculty of Information. She studies the transformation of work and a worker's life in relation to digital technologies, capitalism, and globalization. She is also the co-author of Media and Management, from University of Minnesota Press and Super Sticky WeChat and Chinese Society from Emerald. Professor Chen publishes widely on issues of digital labor and platform studies. Her work has appeared in journals including New Media and Society, Socioeconomic Review, JNOS, The Public, Work, Employment and Society, The Chinese Journal of Communication, and China Perspectives. And we will also be joining by my uh, junior fellow colleague, Jamie Duncan. Jamie is a PhD student at the University of Toronto Center, Center for Criminology and Social Legal Studies and a researcher at the Center for Access to Information and Justice at the University of Winnipeg. He has written and spoken about the issue of advanced technology in police, policing and border security, the political communications of public safety, as well as transparency and accountability in Canadian governance. Jamie's doctoral research focuses on processes of technology adoption and used in border security and is supported by the Canada, Canada Graduate Scholarship in honor of Nelson Mandela. His work has appeared in scholarly publications such as the British Journal of Criminology and popular media outlets like The Globe and Mail. So to begin our conversation, let me start with you, Professor Tybert. Can you give us examples from your experience at the Citizen Lab on the very real threats to democracy that tech companies habilitate or create? Well, first of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be here at Massey College, even virtually. I love Massey. I, I love being there and getting to meet the uh, fellows and and hanging out in just such a, an awesome facility. Um, but here we are doing it virtual instead, making the best of it. 
well, what can I say? What, how do tech platforms affect democracy and human rights? Um, you know, this is a large area. And the work that we do at the Citizen Lab, which has been going on for 20 years, has as part of its focus to um, do a kind of digital accountability research using an interdisciplinary approach. So I'm a political scientist. My background is international relations. My expertise is in international security. But we draw from many different skills and methods to do the work that we do, especially from the technical discipline. discipline. So we have people who are uh, very well trained in computer science, engineering science, law and area studies who are uh, members of the Citizen Lab who do the type of work that we do. Um, we're maybe best thought of as a kind of counterintelligence for civil society. Um, we, we do this very careful evidence-based research, exposing things that are going on beneath the surface that either governments or tech companies don't want you to know about and we believe are uh, important for the public interest, but also maybe causing some kind of harm. In terms of the question directly, I, I think the best way to think about this is in terms of how there are features of the digital ecosystem that we live in that maybe are unintended and yet are causing some kind of harm or are undermining democracy and human rights in some way. They're an unintentional byproduct, you might describe it that way. And I think this especially applies to social media and some of the large tech platforms, and especially the business model underlying them, which uh, Shoshana Zuboff nicely phrased as surveillance capitalism. And, and as I say, this, this is simply unintended consequences for the most part of a system that has been set up um, that's producing all sorts of externalities. Um, you know, there is a long list of these, but I will just sum up by saying, you know, you we, we live in an, a digital ecosystem that is um, invasive by design, uh, first and foremost. So the, the whole point of a lot of the applications that we use on a daily basis, quite apart from how they're advertised, quite apart from what they even look like in on the surface in terms of their principal function, uh, have as their underlying rationale to extract as much data from us, their users. Um, we are, in essence, the livestock for their data farms. So, for example, if you look at an application like a fun game, uh, on the surface, it just looks like a game. Underneath, however, the game is, is designed to um, monitor you, gather up as much information as it can from you, from your social relationships, your habits, your movements, your device, your network, and so on, and then sell that information to other third parties, principally for reasons having to do with the personal data surveillance economy. Another feature is it's insecure. Um, and, and this is not intentional, obviously, um, but it's a byproduct of the fact that software developers, A, are rushing to get things out as quickly as possible, get them as close as possible to users, um, but do it in such a way um, that they don't often prioritize security. Security is largely an afterthought. And secondly, there are no disincentives, or very few anyway, other than largely reputation. Liabilities are almost nothing for most companies. We see data breaches on an almost daily basis um, and a huge data exhaust um, as, as data moves from an application, from a person's you know, personal affairs to a whole series of concentric circles of firms that orbit around the data ecosystem. One example would be location tracking companies. Um, so there is an enormous marketplace of what I think of as largely parasitic firms, kind of bottom feeders of the social media environment uh, that are feeding off of uh, bits of information that comes from applications. Good example would be uh, location tracking information. And they package it up and they sell that to third parties. And then uh, lastly, I would say uh, that the whole overall space is poorly regulated. And this leads to all sorts of abuses. Um, some of the abuses are, are unintentional, but some are actually very intentional. Um, and one of the most serious things that we've been focusing on lately at the Citizen Lab is the harms around the unregulated marketplace for mercenary spyware. Um, so given such an environment uh, where we live, uh, always on, plugged in, data being vacuumed up constantly and circulating in an ecosystem, 
um, it, it has become an imperative really for governments to be able to monitor and take advantage of this this data exhaust. And there's a huge uh, there's a huge number of companies that provide services to them. One of which is mercenary spyware. In, in other words, being able to hack into a device, turn it on, and monitor everything that's going on quietly and surreptitiously. Um, the number of harms and abuses around this area is uh, uh, really jaw-dropping. Uh, almost on a weekly basis, another Citizen Lab report is coming out showing harms in one place or another around the world. So that's a kind of just quick tour to horizon of uh, high-level issues that I think are relevant to the question that you ask. Thank you very much. Moving to Professor Chen. Professor Chen, how would you describe the challenges that tech companies present for our societies, notably from a labor perspective? Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's a great honor. Um, I, I, as Julian has introduced that I study uh, basically the organization, reorganization of work because of the digital technology against the context of global uh, globalized capitalism. Well, as far as I am concerned in the world of work, uh, several things really uh, stand out to me. Uh, well, not all of them are uh, quote unquote new challenges uh, unique to our contemporary society. And I think one of, the, uh, one of the most important things that we need to remember about the organization and reorganization of work uh, because of the tech companies is the fact that many of the chains that we observed today uh, have been going on for quite a bit time in the in the history so uh, i think what what i i most concerned with in terms of uh, the urgent challenges posed by these companies uh, including the following first i think is the um the trend of re reproduction and the perpetuation of social inequality along the lines of the existing uh, social inequalities, uh, such as along the lines of gender lines, racial lines, uh, and the geographical uh, inequalities. Uh, this, this uh, well, there are uh, several examples. Uh, for instance, I think um, I think gig work, you know, gig economy, it's actually a, a great example to illustrate the idea that uh, it tends to be those who have already facing uh, insecure and non-standard. Uh, jobs who will be caught up into the, doing those uh, uh, gig work, such as DoorDash and the you know Uber drivers, uh, and the uh, the second things that uh, I think it's it's very important. It relates to the degradation of work and the, uh, and the, the collectively and gradually uh, the the loss of workers' autonomy in in their labor process. Uh, because uh, because of these digital uh, platform companies that they collect the uh, uh, information from both companies and particularly more intensively from workers uh, to datafy every single step of uh, of the of the work process uh, relying on constant interactions from uh, wor workers themselves so uh, so what, uh, in general terms workers actually face tremendous um, surveillance, you know, m m uh, monitoring, uh, and the control from those digital platforms, and the, uh, that is the loss of uh, of uh, their wor wor workers' autonomy. But on the other hand, um, a, a great majority of them actually also struggling with uh, struggling with earning a living wage. Um, the, there are uh, increasingly a number of studies that have done on the so-called gig workers in multiple different countries, which have shown that that overall uh, they actually earn uh, less than the minimum wage, local minimum wage in, in different countries. So, aggregation of work uh, is a is a is a not, is another challenge, and uh, uh, to just expand on what. Uh, Professor Debert just described about how uh, increasingly these digital uh, tech companies actually relied on farming the data from you know ordinary users, uh, but uh, but more specifically relates to uh, workers because usually workers actually face more intensified data extraction or data collection as compared to uh, consumers. So in that regard. 
uh, they, uh, they actually, it is not just a violation of their privacy for that matter. It is actually, um, they are put into training some, uh, a lot of like uh, algorithms to improve the system. So, uh, so they are actually helping uh, improve the system that actually uh, will increase the control over workers themselves. Uh, but well, last but not least, I think uh, it is also very crucial uh, to pay attention to, um, to the financialized nature of so many tech companies. Uh, let me draw the example of the um, gig work platform uh, companies such as DoorDash and, uh, um, and the Uber Lyft uh, Instant Card as an example. So uh, as compared to like uh, as compared to the manufacturer or factories in the industrial uh, uh, era, these digital platform companies are backed by uh, venture capital, and one of the one of the uh, priority for those uh, tech companies is actually they they wanted to you know go uh, go public, uh, and the, the investors wanted to cash out. So uh, that actually raised a huge problem um, for the operation. Uh, of these companies, uh, in the sense that usually at the very beginning, you know, when the, when that company started uh, was founded, uh, they sit on a huge amount of cash, so they were able to use incentives to attract both uh, consumers and workers. Uh, in that sense, it also kind of like you know, uh, quote unquote, disrupt, but uh, it's uh, it actually poses a threat to small and medium sized business. Um, but uh, in that regard, because of those incentives, they were able to attract a large number of workers to work for them with relatively decent wages, especially in the uh, in the earlier days for them. But uh, well, one of the studies that I have done with a, a, co a course based at a University of Amsterdam, Niels Vendon, we actually found that uh, we compared the food delivery workers in China and the, in, in the States. We found that in both, in both countries, uh, they share the common trend that they would earn a relatively uh, higher wages at the beginning. But, but of course, the cash the, uh, those companies have uh, will hit a limit. And these and and then they, they will start to squeeze the cost and and everything else. The workers will of course will face a downward trend uh, of their uh, of their wages. Uh, so then then in order to make make, make ends meet from a worker's perspective, uh, most of the time they would decide uh, to to kind of like self exploit. They would intensify the uh, the work, you know, either by uh, either by um, uh, uh, extend their work hours, take more shifts, uh, and such and such, uh, which is uh, not only go against a lot of discourses circulating around about the, those digital platforms. Uh, it, it actually also, you know, really, really destabilized uh, the workers' welfare from a more structural point of view. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what I have uh, for now. Thank you, Professor Chen. Now, moving to Jamie, Jamie, from your perspective as a uh, researcher on criminology and with your research on, for example, border security and enforcement, what is your perspective on these issues that we've been discussing today? Hmm. Uh, that's, that's a really interesting question, because I think that when I think about the, the proliferation of, of data-driven technology at the border, and I've, I've just recently been looking through a bunch of access to information requests that have come back there's there's uh the the kinds of influence that one would expect from sort of large tech companies uh aren't obvious right so like the the canada border services agency contracts with say like a a, a company that makes fingerprint scanners uh and they contract with sort of consulting companies uh to to produce these solutions but uh, interestingly a lot of this uh and and counter to, to, to trends that we might see in society more broadly uh, about privatization and uh, the shrinking of government. Uh, a lot of this, this work is, is done in-house with the, with the, the aid of, of expertise from, from outside. Um, I don't think that it's not a threat to, to democracy in, in the same way, because I think that as we see uh, pushing out of, of decision-making, of, of really consequential decision-making into automated decisions, uh, the the kinds of logics that are that are driving decisions are, are both sort of like less attuned to 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 nuance. So if someone's looking to uh, 
to an algorithm to help inform an immigration to system uh, decision, it's not necessarily going to be um, as as uh, sensitive to to the to the reasons behind why some particular constellation of data points uh, frame somebody as risky. Um, but I think that, that that kind of that allows us to, to 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 shift back a little bit and think about sort of like how how we're conceiving of 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 this like sort of intersection of security and, and technology in our society as, as past, past border security. Um, when we think about something like Clearview AI, which was a company that went and took uh, a bunch of images of, of people off of platforms uh, and then sold it back to the police, we can, we can think about this, this reframing of, of, uh, of incentives, right? Like police, Police created demand for this this platform, uh, this this company, Clearview AI, to go off and scrape all of these these images of us, and it created new powers for police and expanded sort of how they can uh, how they can surveil us. And that expansion of surveillance, I think, is 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 really significant to think about when we think about what we mean by by sort of the rule of law. So countries like Canada oftentimes uh, frame themselves on on the world stage as countries that uphold the rule of law, and when we're seeing so much of uh, so much of the way that we live increasingly exists in in sort of jurisdictions that ex extend beyond um, spaces of democratic accountability. And like I, I think that a way that I think through this is is through this 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 concept of of like the infrastructures of everyday life. So if we if we're so many of our interactions are captured on social media platforms, and so many images of us can be found online, uh, that takes more and more of, of the way that we live our lives outside of spaces that can be sort of meaningfully governed by, by what we would know as sort of democratic accountability. And I think that that raises really big questions for what we mean by, by the rule of law and the role of, of policing and enforcement institutions in society when, when we can't necessarily hold a company that, that's in the United States or, or elsewhere uh, to, to account uh, for, for sort of transgressions against uh, Canadian citizens. Thank you, Jamie. Now, my, my next question will be then to Professor Diver, because Professor Diver, you, you mentioned that some of these harms are created by unintended byproducts uh, or I, yeah, conse unintended consequences from these um, companies, but also uh, from Professor Chen's intervention and Jamie, we can see that they still operate in a very active way and under the rule of law. What can uh, civil society actors do uh, face to these large power differentials, vast companies with a lot of wealth uh, who don't have any uh, transparency or are not held accountable in many cases for the products that they uh, deploy in society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, let, let me just backtrack a bit and, and just uh, uh, reflect on, on something that uh, um, was said earlier. Um, to add to, to already the comments, the very good comments that have been made about some of the issues that we face. One thing I want to highlight is the pandemic. I think that if you look, for example, at precarious workers and uh, the big tech platforms surveillance of those workers, and especially how uh, marginalized communities are disproportionately affected in, in every possible way that we could imagine having to do with all of the topics that we're describing, the pandemic has made it all worse. And that's because we're now more than ever reliant on a technological infrastructure that already has a kind of rotting foundation is the way I think about it. Um, so if you look um, over the last couple of years, you can't help but notice the number of Amazon packages being delivered. Uh, I think Jeff Bezos's personal wealth went up like something like 60 billion uh, in, in, in the first uh, six to eight months of the pandemic, I think it is, I don't know. The exact number. It was a lot, though. Um, this already extremely rich person became even more rich. Um, why? Because we're all now um, reluctant to go into shopping malls and, and we're using Amazon services more than ever, um, which, by the way, in addition to the uh, stresses and inequities placed on uh, the workers in, in, the, um, in the warehouses and, and in the dispensaries and on the streets in terms of the facilities and the trucks. Um, it also uh, is an enormous drain on the natural environment. Amazon's web services, which 
um, are used, by the way, uh, to power streaming services like Netflix um, are terrible in terms of drawing on energy sources that come from fossil fuel. Um, so this is a good example of what I mean by some of the unintended consequences. It's not like people um, knowingly go into this and and want to drive up the value and the opportunities for surveillance and exploitation by the tech platforms or amplify some of the, the ecological footprints of our data uh, machine driven civilization. It just has happened um, out of necessity in a way, um, a byproduct, if you will. Um, that's often how history unfolds in, in all sorts of contingent ways. What does civil society do about this? Well, uh, the way I look at it is that, uh, first of all, there's an awareness raising job to be done. And that's uh, where the citizen lab sits, frankly. Um, you know, I'm generalizing here, but with most tech companies, a lot of what they're doing is uh, beneath the surface. It's hidden behind uh, layers of, uh, you know, proprietary legal claims uh, that shield their inner workings from outside scrutiny. This also relates to the point I made earlier about the lack of regulation in this space. Um, so here in Canada, uh, across the country, every province has a privacy commissioner and we have a federal privacy commissioner's office, uh, but they're understaffed, their mandate is kind of thin, um, they don't have uh, a lot of resources, and even if they do, um, the, the most of the companies of concern are domiciled outside of Canada, there's a limit to the reach of our law. Um, and, and so the, at, at, a, at a first brush, civil society needs to pry open that lair, and especially those who are in academia. Um, in fact, I see it as my responsibility, given the mission of the Citizen Lab, to be quite adversarial about it. Um, there's, there's a risk to that. Uh, I have been sued. Um, the University of Toronto has been threatened with lawsuits because of my research from very large companies who don't want their uh, activities exposed. Um, we uh, are very bullish, for example, about protecting the value of being able to break encryption uh, of some of the applications that people rely on in order to understand whether there is some security vulnerability that'll put people at risk. Um, and some companies might you know, try to stop that through litigation. Um, but, um, you know, that's that's the, the fight that we face. So there's an awareness raising point about it. Um, obviously, uh, you need to get the public uh, motivated, and that requires communicating outside of small academic circles. Um, as I as I go on in my career, I, I'm less and less interested in publishing in peer reviewed journal articles and going to academic conferences. I'm much more interested in communicating to the general public, which is why I was happy to deliver the Massey lectures. Um, we're very um, lucky, but we also work hard at the Citizen Lab to make sure our research is exposed widely through the media. Um, just yesterday, you may have seen that we published a report about some of the insecurities in the Beijing Winter Olympics app. Um, and that was covered in just about every major news organization. Um, why do we do that? so that the journalists and others, athletes who may be attending the game hear about it. So, you know, there's a big awareness raising job, but then we need to go further. And I think ultimately you can address every one of these issues that we're talking about, whether it's um, labor conditions, workplace surveillance, um, you know, the data exhaust that leads to privacy breaches, unregulated commercial surveillance technologies being abused by autocratic governments, without uh, principled democratic governance. Uh, so we need to um, uh, develop proposals where governments can take actions and encourage them to do so, uh, starting here in Canada. And it can be done at multiple levels. Um, just to give you one example, there was mention of Clearview AI and facial recognition technology. Um, that's a hard problem to solve at a global level, but you can work at a municipal level Many uh, municipalities have actually uh, been able to push through uh, moratoriums uh, on police agencies in their jurisdictions using maybe facial recognition or artificial intelligence or both combined until there can be proper safeguards put in place. 
So we may not be able to solve this issue globally, but we may be able to accomplish some things locally. Uh, and here we can borrow a well-known phrase from the environmental movement where you think globally and act locally. Same can apply to some of the issues around digital technologies, I would say. Thank you. And that's, that's fascinating. It actually makes me think also that it applies as well for the from the labor perspective. And I have a question now for Professor Chin, now that we're talking about citizen action, is how has um, collective bargaining, unionization, and other forms of resistance, uh, how, how are they configured today in a world where uh, now digital platforms dominate a lot of the um, outsource market, especially for with platforms? Yeah, well, uh, I think uh, as far as, I, well, to my knowledge, I think the picture is mixed. Uh, I think um, uh, perhaps partially uh, because of the pandemic, uh, so many uh, uh, front frontline workers uh, the, in the essential services uh, have been uh, overstretched to almost like unbearable um, point. And, uh, and, and of course, also because of uh, so many um, uh, uh, de degradation of work conditions in many service sectors because of the uh, digital um, platform companies, we indeed see uh, waves of uh, unionizing efforts by workers uh, in, in multiple different sectors. You know, uh, in, in traditional like teacher, uh, teachers, uh, uh, warehouse uh, workers. Well, in terms of warehouse workers, there are success, but there are also failure in terms of uh, uh, unionizing. Uh, we also see uh, a lot of uh, actually is uh, unionizing, but also lawsuits. Uh, for instance, in the UK, uh, drivers was enabled to be recognized as employee instead of uh, independent contractors, uh, and as well as uh, many other countries. Uh, uh, however, uh, I also I have also noticed that um, in many uh, developing countries uh, uh, or other sectors where uh traditionally has been dominated by uh, informally employed uh, workforces uh these efforts towards uh, unionizing um more formally uh collective bargaining uh, uh collective actions uh hasn't really seen uh, like tremendous uh growth uh, let, let me just put it that way and uh, uh, but uh, but it, but it doesn't mean that there is no like uh, resistance on a daily basis going on. Actually, uh, I think almost on almost all um, on-demand service platforms, you know, uh, for the ride hailing, for the food delivery, um, actually the workers were able to, uh, for instance, it's very common for workers to establish online mutual uh, support groups so that they can work out some sort of like working knowledge about the algorithms and etc. And uh, uh, they, uh, th there are actually scattered, small scaled uh, actions uh, across the globe, actually in, in many countries. But in terms of their institutionalized uh, rights for collective bargaining, uh, I would say, uh, especially in the sectors that are heavily influenced, uh, impacted by the uh, digital platforms, um, they are, workers are fighting very hard in, uh, in the uphill battles. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, increasing uh, their collective bargaining power. Um, just uh, to pick up on what has previously mentioned, uh, uh, I, I would assume that we will talk about regulation, but I think here it's, it's actually a, a, another like nice place to pick it up in terms of uh, uh, employment uh, relations. Mm -hmm. because, because actually, uh, I think uh, workers, uh, speaking of, you know, acting locally, uh, workers as a social subjects, their social life and uh, their social relations are highly contextualized. Uh, workers have very different experience with the same app uh, in the U.S. as compared to, uh, for instance, Indonesia. Uh, and, and I think the local culture and the uh, a very long local history in terms of workers institutional rights and the institutional resources for workers to collective bargaining or whether unions are legal or illegal actually really matters in terms of shaping what kind of actions 
uh, workers will take and uh, what kind of uh, institutional and uninstitutional informal resources workers were, were able to mobilize uh, themselves to uh, contend for their collective interests. So I think that that part is very important and uh, uh, in terms of the regulation or uh, in terms of the laws of um, uh, employment relations, um, I think in most of the uh, developed societies such as Canada, uh, US and UK, this binary between independent contractors and the employee uh, status uh, seems to be really occupying the central place in terms of uh, uh, in terms of the regulation of uh, digital labor platforms. Uh, and of course, many other countries, uh, uh, as far as I know, like Brazil, India, uh, Indonesia, and including China, they also published, uh, uh, well, to various uh, extent, pa um, passed some regulations to expand the social security coverage. Uh, but overall, in those countries where uh, the, again, the informal labor forces has been uh, traditionally dominant in the society, which means there is no clear distinction between the employee status and the self uh, and the self-employed or uh, independent contractors, because historically speaking, they are they they have been uh, existing in these gray areas where uh, the social security and the uh, workplace protections has not really been institutionalized. So I think for them, perhaps uh, the first step, well, on top of the collective bargaining power, the first step is perhaps to push forward some sort of institutionalization of uh, uh, you know, social welfare and uh, uh, other workplace uh, protections. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. And now it's still speaking about uh, what can be done in action, collective action. My next question is for Jamie. Uh, you mentioned earlier that in, a, in many law enforcement agencies, they operate under the law uh, and many abuses happen under these frameworks. I was thinking, what can you tell us about forms of uh, resistance or um, dissent faced to these approaches? And especially, I was thinking, especially for those who are not considered part of the state directly thinking of refugees and migrants, for example. What can you tell us about that? Huh, that's, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I've, if, if, you'll, if you'll allow me, I'd love to just sh shift the framing a little bit and uh, hopefully I'll still speak to the, to the same thing. Because um, I think that when we're talking about regulations, it's increasingly also a question of like what governments or, or regulatory bodies can do. Um, so, so it kind of makes me think of, uh, of a story because uh, before, I, before I came back to do my PhD, I did a stint at the federal government working in technology policy. And when, when COVID hit, I was assigned as a, as a policy analyst to this COVID alert exposure notification app. Um, and at the, times, uh, at the time, there was like a lot of discourse about how we could use these smartphones in our pockets to help with contact tracing. Um, a bunch of privacy and cybersecurity experts began proposing different frameworks for decentralized exposure notifications. Um, and and these, these first apps that got developed were using sort of like either uh, GPS or they were using Bluetooth pings uh, to, to track those with whom we had close contacts. Um, Bluetooth was, was sort of perceived as this more privacy protective solution, um, but it didn't really work uh, well because like our phones wouldn't allow this to happen uh, in the background. So like when your phone was locked, it wouldn't work. Um, in the end, Apple and Google, the two companies that dominate the smartphone market, uh, they came out with this privacy preserving contact tracing protocol, which sort of serves as this as the back end framework to this, this COVID alert app. Um, I think that this, this case and the reason why I shifted this question is, is because this is uh, an instance of what political scientists might call coercive policy diffusion. Um, not all these states wanted to use this framework, but they were more or less forced to if they wanted these apps to work. Uh, as they were designed. And uh, so uh, I say that because I think that when we're thinking about how to govern platforms and the, the effects of platforms, we need to think about how platforms also govern. And uh, and like the platforms establish sort of these jurisdictions over the digital tools they create. In this case, uh, Google and Apple sort of demonstrated uh, a sort of functional sovereignty in a lot of ways. And, and the way that this played out looked a lot more sort of like a diplomatic negotiation than sort of like handing down regulations as, as people might oftentimes 
think about re regulation and to, to bring this back to sort of what we might do and how how there, there are opportunities for resistance here um, uh, the, the thing that I'd like to see to see change and I think that the thing that people can can kind of this kind of change that people can encourage is is really forcing governments to rely on different kinds of expertise so this is an opportunity to sort of reclaim power. I think both uh, for, for, for folks who are especially vulnerable in the face of the state, sort of like, like folks who are undocumented, but also uh, for the role of civil society more broadly, when we look at the kinds of expertise that we're drawing on to, to uh, that served on say the advisory council for this, this COVID alert app, or even Canada's sort of broader advisory council on artificial intelligence, there are, there are folks from not-for-profits and civil society sort of included but when we look at the decisions that are being made it's uh there's this clear over representation of of sort of business folks and and computer scientists who are who, who have funding from like large tech companies and what i think that like we need to do as as individuals as academics and as citizens uh is, is support civil society organizations and really uh really ask them to be a part of these discussions um uh, we, we need basically we need more sort of like access now and the citizen lab at these tables and less of sort of AI entrepreneurs and computer scientists funded by by big companies. Thank you, Jamie. Now that we're approaching the last segment of today's dialogue, I would like to invite those who are watching us to please write down some questions for our panelists. And I will ask one question to everyone. Please feel free to intervene at any time. Are we going lead? Are we going towards a techno dystopia or is a bright future possible? What do you think about it? Beginning with anyone. Can it be you, Ron? Uh, well, look, I, I, I think you know that it's it's always um, not helpful to, to simplify a very complicated world um in 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 a way that says that we you know heading towards a dystopia or utopia um these are sometimes convenient ways to uh shake people up um you know classically both have been used to either um present to people a picture of the future that they want to avoid or perhaps aspire to and i think they're useful in that context i'm a fan of science fiction and i think science fiction and other arts, for that matter, uh, do a good job of of kind of forecasting. Um, even though that's not their intent, uh, they present a picture of the future that that either we want to strive to or avoid. As I say, um, I, I think that there are some very disturbing trends today. I think we're living at a time where um, there is an undeniable descent into authoritarianism. Uh, globally. It's a transnational problem. It's connected to kleptocracy and organized crime and huge inequalities of wealth. Um, a lot of this has been amplified by the digital technologies we've been talking about. Um, of course, it's not reducible to them, but they are a major contributing factor in a variety of ways. For example, um, I think it's undeniable that there are huge social costs and costs to uh, the quality of public discourse to have the principal vehicle through which we communicate uh, be a medium that is organized around the personal data surveillance economy and attention grabbing algorithms. Um, we can debate at the margins about what specific effects it is having, do so all sorts of quantitative analysis on public opinion and so forth. But um, at the bottom of it all, I think it's undeniable that this is creating the kind of toxic atmosphere that we see um, all too often, or uh, contributing to it at least. And, and so, um, you know, there's so many individual bits of the puzzle like that that we need to work on correcting. Um, and, and I'll just, you know, Jamie brought up something about civil society. I agree very much with his remarks. Um, you know, it is unfortunate here in Canada, we do not have a very vibrant uh, civil society around technology policy and digital technologies generally. And that, that's a big shortcoming. I wish, I wish that gap could be filled. Technically speaking, the Citizen Lab doesn't really do advocacy. Uh, it's not part of our mission. Uh, we do policy engagement, but that's a different thing. Um, it would be nice to have a, like an EFF of Canada 
There are a few small organizations that try to do this, but not enough of them. In part, it's a reflection of the size of the country, of course, um, but we need it. We need people to speak up about the issues that are being discussed on this panel. And maybe that's something that um, the junior fellows and students connected to Massey College could help organize. Um, but I, 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 I feel hopeful about the future in spite of the fact that we face uh, something we really haven't talked about much except a bit sideways, uh, you know, a major existential risk right now, a catastrophic risk at least around climate change that's uh, right in our face. Um, if we don't radically change how, how we are living and what we are doing, this whole conversation is pointless. And I truly believe that. Uh, in fact, that that is why I am doing the work that I do, because if the uh, communications environment within which we live is so dysfunctional to those larger aims, we can't even have a conversation without disinformation and intense surveillance and maltreatment of, of people in the ways that we are seeing, then we're doomed, frankly. Um, so there are some very serious existential risks. They're undeniable and uh, we need to face up to them. But, you know, humans are clever and uh, we are social and, and we have ways of organizing ourselves towards a, a more just, um, equitable future. And that's also why I do what I do. So um, I, I, at the bottom of it all, I'm very optimistic uh, that we can get this done. But we need to work hard. Thank you. Other thoughts from the panelists? Oh well, I I would like to say um, I think a techno dystopian and a techno utopian are two sides of the same coin. Uh, well, the problem with that, either positive or or, or extremely positive, or just the positive or uh, just the negative. Uh, it's actually uh, uh, running the risk of um, being trapped by um, fetishizing, fetishizing uh, technology, uh, which I think what we need to do actually is to demystify um, technology. Uh, not because, because well, now it's really a cliche to say it is uh, technology is actually not a panacea for social problems, social inequality, economic inequality, uh, we have talked a lot about, uh, you know, um, in, in today's dialogue that um, so many uh, civil rights and uh, uh, private right has been violated, uh, workers' right has been uh, erode, erode, and work conditions has been uh, degraded. Uh, all these problems uh, cannot be fixed by technology. Uh, I really like um, the segment of our conversation on the role placed by uh, uh, civil society, which actually needs to be, uh, again, uh, to echo the points that are, has already been raised, uh, to encourage a wider participation and representation uh, by uh, non-tech and non-business world, including workers, including you know, uh, scholars, uh, particularly social scientists. I also would like to uh, just add a bit, uh, based on my um, individual observations, uh, I think um, precisely because of the uh, ubiquitous of all these uh, tech companies, uh, which seems to be everywhere in our daily life, right? From uh, from uh, shopping to, uh, to transport, uh, everything. Uh, and because of the pandemic that we really need to rely on all kinds of digital technologies to maintain our human connectivity and the connections. And I think I have actually observed a, uh, a increasing interest um, on the digital rights, data rights, uh, and the more closely to the area that I am doing the research, I've observed a more interest from the people I know, and also uh, from students, particularly because I believe students represent the future. Um, students actually show more interest in uh, uh, the rights, the you know workers' rights, their conditions in today's uh, economy and today's world, which I believe is a very good thing. And uh, and uh, since you know the four of us uh, who actually are speaking uh, today, we are educators or future educators, but but. Uh, I think that is actually a very good sign that uh, uh, more and more students seem to start to uh, be aware of the possible problems. 
Thank you very much. Jamie, any thoughts on this discussion? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of, um, of our discussion actually at the, 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 the schwartz Riesman uh, graduate workshop that, that Julian and I were both a part of, uh, I think it was last month. And it was right about the time where Facebook was, was rebranding itself as Meta. And everyone was thinking about the metaverse and to a certain extent, some people still are. And it's now wrapped up in all of this Web3 discourse and all of this stuff. But I remember thinking through like, meta or the metaverse as, it, as it's pitched sounds really cool and i'm like what are the problems with the metaverse the problems with the metaverse are that it's a field day for for surveillance capitalists my problems with the metaverse aren't have nothing to do with the technology it sounds super cool it's that facebook's going to be uh, or at least trying to position itself as on top of this right so i think that the the significance of this realization for me is is people many many folks um will we'll focus on, on different technical affordances and they'll focus on sort of the potential for for things to 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 surveil us and to limit our democratic uh way of life um but but the, the hope in there for me is that like what if it was what if it was civil society organizations that held different values that were motivated by different values that were governing what can and cannot be done with technology and uh a further sort of site of hope, I think, comes back to Professor Diebert's point earlier on, is that there's lots of opportunities to begin regulating this, this sort of infrastructure of everyday life where our livelihoods and our social connections are super dependent on. There's lots of opportunities to, to regulate that at, at more local levels. And there's lots of opportunities to resist um, the encroachment of, of, uh, of surveillance and, and private influence in, in, in more sort of local settings, uh, whether that's here at, at Massey College and the University of Toronto, uh, the, the there's a really exciting event coming up at the Center for Ethics next week on, on some of the Citizen Labs uh, submission to uh, the Toronto Police Department on their use of artificial intelligence technology. So I think that because we we are both social beings and, and oftentimes more local than, than not, there's there's lots of hope for for, for intervening in, in things that seem like like uh, major or intractable social or technical challenges. Thank you, Jamie. I would like to finish today's dialogue with one of the questions from one of our viewers, Farah Kandakar, who is an um, anthropologist and data scientist and recent alumna from the Faculty of Information. Farah says, it kind of seems like the tech companies that are the, are the ones telling us what is the latest and greatest technologies out there. So how can citizens become aware of what else is out there? Uh, is it is it a possibility that citizen-driven technologies and not market-driven ones will be widely adopted? And, and actually, I would like to add to that question about, because we have the open, uh, open source software movement for decades. Many technologies have been invented with actually a more, uh, uh, an idea of liberty, an idea of decentralization, but then platforms and companies come in and get a hold on it and exert their power over it. We, we saw with the internet having oligopolies today, uh, many of those so-called decentralized currencies now have a lot of intermediaries uh, taking, uh, like earning wealth from that decentralized uh, currencies as well. So is it a possibility for more citizen-driven technologies out there and especially for them to remain citizen-based? Well, yes, there certainly is a possibility for that. I think that um, we we need to start exploring and advocating for them. Um, picking up again on what what Jamie said, I agree that um, you know maybe something like the metaverse would be cool if it was structured and and managed in a different way. Um, there's no problem in thinking about forms of social media that are not. Um, driven by by the imperatives of surveillance capitalism and an intention seeking algorithm what would that look like how is something like that viable um i should add that that's why uh, we have governments that support certain types of public models of things um you know there's a long tradition of of thinking about the utility of of publicly sponsored um not even necessarily publicly run um forms of of community engagement and forms of media um we have a national broadcaster in this country although it's poorly funded and increasingly uh more poorly funded as time goes by uh bbc is currently under threat as we speak um it would be it would take a, a just a shift i think in terms of priorities 
to understand why things like that are important. I'll, I'll just conclude by saying that the university has a job to do here. Um, you know, there is so much uh, research and innovation driven at the university at the uh, at the request of big tech platforms and big pharmaceutical companies and other big uh, private companies. Um, we, you know, that perhaps uh, there is a need, a necessity to have funding that comes from private sources. Otherwise, we couldn't do what we do. Uh, but it's it, it's gotten to the point, in my view, that it is uh, really undermining the core mission of the university. Um, there's far too much uh, discussion around innovation for innovation's sake. You know, innovation is basically an empty term. It's devoid of content. It's kind of like modernization. Um, at 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 best, it's an empty term. At worst, it's loaded with hidden uh, ideology. And I think that's the case where we see innovation centers everywhere. Uh, what does that mean? To me, it means, oh, we have to, um, you know, basically uh, develop technology for private gain. Um, but what about the public good? Um, isn't that the core mission of the university? Weren't universities originally invented in order to act as custodians of, of knowledge, to speak truth to power, to be a space where adversarial research could happen and research is undertaken in the public interest. That's what I thought I was signing up for. Um, and I think it's it's also why tenure, uh, which is often um, these days um, criticized, um, is very valuable uh, because we need to have a protected space for those sorts of things to go on. If not in the university, where, where else? Uh, we have far too much privatization of everything else of, of our public life. Uh, we need to preserve uh, a sense of publicness at the university. Thank you very much. Any other final thoughts from our other panelists? Uh, if, if it's okay, I just would quickly love to, to comment on, on Ferry's question, which I think was a really, really good one and a really important one. If I, if I look back to the, the case of the COVID alert app that I mentioned earlier, the, it wasn't actually tech companies that came up with this idea. It was, uh, there were academics in the US and the EU that became very interested in, in developing uh, these, these apps for contact tracing in, in a way that uh, protected people's privacy. And I think that there are valid arguments about uh, whether our smartphones should be used as a technological solution to, to, uh, to a pandemic or, or to contact tracing. But it, it's, it's important to, to note that Google and Apple didn't come up with this idea, rather they imposed how we were going to go about doing that. And uh, I think that that resonates with, uh, with Professor Diebert's point about sort of the, the role of the, the university, because there was a public interest motivation and that, that motivation was captured through sort of a fetishization of, of both innovation and, and sort of the, 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 the expertise or the power that we give to, to these big companies to, to act. We see them as more, uh, as, more viable or authoritative actors on, on these kinds of technical problems as a society. Um, I would like to just add one last thought on uh, responding to the question about how citizens can be more aware or how citizens actually can develop sort of a more critical lens on uh, the promotion of all the discourses promoted by the tech companies to really uh, to question uh, to help I, I think it's to help citizens to uh, understand that the technologies that are usually promoted or promoted as the greatest by the tech companies uh, uh, to a certain extent that is actually a discourse because uh, in many of the uh, disciplines and the, and the field uh, almost all the the cutting edge, like foundational cutting edge uh, research and the technological breakthrough still happened in the labs at the universities and the research institutes. The, the distinction between those labs and institutions uh, versus the big tech companies is that they are not living in the culture of promotion. So I think uh, it's, it's very important uh, to you know, to revisit to visit the example of metaverse, uh, the the renaming of, of of the company, the the action to rename it, uh, and to really portray this idea of you know metaverse, uh, 
it, it, it can can be considered to be a call for us to really be, become more critical of the uh, discursive power of those terms. Uh, for us to uh, to buy into that, oh, that that is uh, the greatest technology. So basically, I think uh, the public, including uh, the universities and you know the students, us and the uh, civil society, uh, have a mission here to really uh, defend, but also to redefine uh, public value uh, in today's society, and uh, to not let those uh, giant tech companies to uh, to um, enclose enclose those public values, and also uh, by kind of like uh, uh, redefine the public values. Thank you very much. And to all panelists, thank you very much for being here. It's been an incredible session of the Massey Dialogues. To everyone attending, thank you so much for tuning in. Please like this video and subscribe to the Massey YouTube channel for more great content for the community. Have a great afternoon and hope to see you very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.